Welcome to the West End Video Newsletter. My name is Joe LaPiccolo, your host for this week's newsletter. Today we're going to take a, an inside look at two prominent Boston historical groups, the West End Historical Society and the Bostonian Society. Let me introduce our guest today. First we have Paula Posnick of the West End Branch Library. Paula, what is your title there? Your Adult Services Librarian. Okay. And next we have uh, uh, Dave Robbins from Suffolk University, or Assistant <coughs> Dean, Dave? That's right, of the College of Little Arts and Sciences. Great. And next we have Phil Bergen of the uh, a Librarian at the Bostonian Society. That's right. Great. And I know you're going to bring us a lot of history today. Uh, we'll start with you, Paula. Paula, how did the West End Historical Society get started? The committee actually formed in May of 1987. It was formed through a core group that was established at the library that year to form a Western Historical Reunion. The goal of the committee is to gather materials of historic interest and create a comprehensive collection in multimedia on the Old West End of Boston. For those of you not familiar with the Old West End of Boston, um, we're collecting materials through the 1800s up to the 1950s. In 1958, the demolition of the area took place. And we're going to also gather materials through the beginning of urban renewal. Mm -hmm. And we're concentrating on a multimedia collection since there are only eight to ten buildings still in existence of this area. What are some of those buildings? Massachusetts General Hospital, the Bullfinch Building, the Charles Street Jail, St. Joseph's Church, Old West Church, mm -hmm. um, the African Meeting House, the old Starrow's Building of the mm -hmm. West End House is still in existence, taken over by Mass General, Suffolk University on the Hill, um, the Vilna Shul, which is right now under. So those, those, those properties are located like at Lower Beacon Hill and... The left on. slope of Beacon Hill mm -hmm. in addition to the traditional Old West End on the other side of Cambridge Street down to Causeway Street and to the Charles. The, dis the boundaries have always been in dispute mm -hmm. of the Old West End, but traditionally from Pinckney Street on down. The West End was sort of a, the Old West End was sort of an urban village, was sort of isolated from it was the either city. the first place or second place that immigrants from Europe would come mm -hmm. to live and build their families and homes. Right. Now, wh how did uh, the interests of, of the West End historical, all West End historical history, come about? What what caused you to start this group? As an adult services librarian, many patrons came into the branch library at the West End looking for information on not only the old West End, but a lot on West End demolition. And um, there is not much other than Urban Villagers by Herbert Gans and Mark Fried's The World of the Urban Working Class. Mm -hmm. Those are two books that were, they were, they were put out in the 1950s. And it spurred my interest to create a larger collection than those two books. Mm -hmm. And it was a gradual process, an evolutionary process. In the, about 1984, we had a Know Your Neighborhood series at the library that I created. And um, many leaders from organizations in the present West End came to speak. During those uh, lectures and after the lectures, I gathered information from them and asked them for historical backgrounds on their institutions. As a result, I was able to gather some photos and some written histories of Suffolk University, Mass General, and other places. But it was not enough, and there was not enough time for me alone to do this. Um, in 1986, I was connected through individuals to the West End newsletter, which had just started becoming published. And I met you, Joe, and I met Jimmy Campano, the editor. And the following year, we created with the anniversary, I believe it was the 175th anniversary of Old West Church, where the library was housed for 60 years, mm -hmm. a special reunion to be held at the library that spring. And for that, we created a special group of people. We were a part of it. Jimmy was other leaders in the West End community and the former West End community. The, the reunion was highly successful. People were very interested and responsive, and people were also 
bringing pictures and memorabilia to the library. At that point, I didn't want to let the committee go. We were just starting rather than ending an event. Um, and as a result, we created the West End Historical Committee mm -hmm. that May. We also added Dave Robbins, and I spoke with Dr. Daniel Perlman, who was the president of Suffolk University at the time. And we invited them to be part of the committee mm -hmm. for their historical knowledge and value. The primary goals at that time were to create an oral history taping project and begin working on that. Oh, great. And tell me something. Do you have uh, many former West Enders come into the library and ask you about uh, if you have memorabilia or to try to uh, get you to put them in touch with other former West Enders? And where do they come from? Do they come from some Boston or all over the world or the country? Or can you get some them? people already have lived in the neighborhood for a number of years. Some of them have lived their whole lives in the area. Some of them are coming back to the area. Some of them come to visit to the library to see if we know of people and know of such friends. And through the West Ender newsletter, we keep them apprised and in touch with goings on of their contemporaries. Mm -hmm. um, we also get journalists. We have researchers that come in. We have plenty of students that come in to use the library collection. Oh, great. Dave, uh, we get back to you now, Dave. Uh, what, what role does, does uh, Suffolk University have in all of this? How did you get interested in, in the West End subject? Well, Suffolk University has been in the West End for 70 years or so. Uh, we built a building on Dern Street in 1920 and mm -hmm. had been in kind of rented buildings until then. So there's been a long history of contact between the immigrant neighborhood in the West End and Suffolk. Uh, Suffolk was founded as a law school to serve exactly the kind of folks that lived in the West End. And there's been a, uh, just a, a flood of people who've come to the university, have made it up through the legal profession, and are now uh, very concerned alumni. So our involvement with the West End is very pleasing to a lot of law school alumni. Mm. Uh, some of our other alumni are, are less ancient. They haven't been around quite as long. The College of Liberal Arts wasn't open until 1934 and didn't really grow to any size until after the war. So those are people, some of whom lived in the West End, but mostly it's our, our law school people who are gener very uh, grateful to Suffolk for having given, given them a leg up on it. So in, in involving the university, uh, I guess I, I kind of carried them in because I'd, I'd written the history of the university and had done Boston history for quite a while and had done a lot of oral history as part of the history of Suffolk University that I wrote. And so Paula kind of brought me into this to give her a hand with historical information about the larger Boston picture mm -hmm. and specifically oral history expertise. But the, uh, the administration, the faculty, and as I say, a lot of the alumni at the university were very, very pleased with the opportunity to get involved with the West End. Surely will. It's, it's great history there. Uh, you've been involved in some of the uh, videotaping of former residents of the West End. Can you give us a perspective of that uh, on your experience with former residents? The, the French novelist Proust, writing in the 1920s, tells a story about taking a, a small little cake, taking a bite of it, and then having done so, memories flood back over him about his childhood and what it was like to, to experience the entire world in which, when he was a child, he ate a little piece of cake like that. Memories that he didn't even remember he had came back. Well, it's interesting to watch a lot of the people that come in to be videotaped, because when they come in, they look around and they're a little frightened of the camera and of the lights and of the interviewer. Five minutes into the interview, you can watch them change. Their faces light up. They begin experiencing the flood of memories from the long gone West End. They're back there. They're experiencing a world in, in brighter colors than they have since they were kids in many cases. It's really remarkable to watch it. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're getting information out of it that's absolutely invaluable. Mm -hmm. But I honestly believe that they're undergoing an experience that is extremely good for them, too. Many of them are older now. I mean, the West End has been closed for many years. And to watch them, it's, it's as though they, they shed 30 and 40 years in, in mm. uh, 40 seconds. That's great. It is. Yeah, it's amazing. So you're, you're really, you, you have two purposes there. You're, you're, you're forming history, and you're bringing nostalgia back to a whole group of people who have no West End to go back to. 
Yeah, in a very real way, they, they are reconstructing the West End. They are they're taking it from the place they've hidden it away, and they're, they're making, again, as, as Proust said, he, he had a, a phrase about this. He said that the town that he'd lived in as a child was mostly gone to the physical eye, but to the eye of the, the, the senses, to the eye of the imagination, it was still there intact. Mm -hmm. And to those people, and I think to the people who watch our tapes, the West End will be there still intact. Mm -hmm. David, we have a, a great collection that we're talking about of, of uh, videotapes of history of Lama West Enders. What, what are the future plans for these tapes or goals? There are several goals. Uh, the, the major problem in the way of all of them is that we have approximately 70 hours of tape now. We've interviewed 50 to 60 people. And the difficulty is we have to get most of that transcribed before we can really have a road map to where the good stuff is in there. There's a lot of it, but nobody knows quite where it is. And editing it into one of the things we're aiming for, which is a, uh, a compiled video, uh, which gives a sense of a lot of the different ways that, that people have revealed the West End to us. That involves knowing where everything is so you can go in and get it and then put it together and maybe intercutting it with some photographs and with maps of the West End and with all sorts of other things. So the principal problem initially is to get the thing transcribed. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a few students from Suffolk University, work-study students, who are giving us a hand with the project. But all in all, we need a lot more help than that. It's a major obstacle. And one thing that I think we'd like to find is people that would be interested in helping us transcribe this. It's wonderful stuff to watch. And if you have any transcribing skills at all and are interested in history, even in a moderate way, this is real grabber. This, these personal histories are, are extremely interesting. So that's a request, I guess, we'd like to get out. Mm, that's interesting. And from there, uh, we're also hoping to get uh, a book, an oral history, as it were, of the West End, uh, which will also contain some more traditional histories to frame it. Um, there are different ways of approaching it. I mean, if you want to do it by tape, that's one approach if you want to do it spread out in front of you so you have more feel for the, the texture of the thing in words. Uh, that's the other approach we're going to take. And that will probably have a lot of the pictures in it as well. Great. David, from a, from a historical point of view, why is this project so important to, to Suffolk and, and to others? Well, the West End in itself is extremely important. Um, I think first and foremost, and this is where a lot of the interest right now in the West End has come from, is that it, it is, as many people have said, an example of how not to do urban renewal. It's a way of, in, in looking at the West End, the reactions of the people who were in the West End, it's a way of looking at the, who the victims of that kind of displacement are, and just exactly what was displaced, this urban village which was ripped out of its setting and its people thrown to the four winds. Is, is a classic example of the kind of, of bad management of urban renewal, which has informed and continues to inform what passes for urban renewal today. I think it's given some wisdom to people who are interested in renewing cities uh, as the big mistake that you want to avoid. Mm -hmm. uh, the other aspect of it is that the West End, which is brought to life by the people who remember it, was an ethnic an inter-ethnic neighborhood, a way in which all, a place in which, and in many ways a way in which uh, people from all sorts of ethnic backgrounds really got on extraordinarily well. I mean, these were not sort of poor and happy peasants. They were people who were urban dwellers who really knew how to create a community, who did it against all the odds in the face of grinding poverty. And looking at the society around us today where there is poverty, often in the face of wealth, but in which the society is, is torn asunder by the tension between the two, there's something to be learned from the West End. I think different people have different ideas about what they're going to learn, but there's an awful lot that needs to be learned about how people get along with one another, and how people from different ethnic groups and different backgrounds get along with one another. Mm -hmm. And from everything people have told us, and I don't think it's just through the eyes of nostalgia, it's not just through the heart, the West End was a place like that. And if we can find just a little of that elixir from this project, I think we will have done a major service. Oh, that's a great, that's a great word you're saying there. I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Paul, we get back to you. Paul, are, uh, uh, 
As far as the taping is concerned, do you get any requests for people to, to look at these tapes? And you have other materials on the West End. Where do people come to? Can you give us the address to where people were coming? Sure. The taping is done at the West End Branch Library, and the tapes are housed at the branch as well. The library is at 151 Cambridge Street in Boston, two doors down from Old West Church, and right next to the Charles River Plaza complex. Okay. There are people, people that have been taped already, have been coming back to see their tapes mm -hmm. and bringing their friends and making appointments. Everything does need to be done by appointment because of the use of the room has to be insured and the equipment has to be available. Okay, that's fine. Uh, ne next we're going to bring you to, we're going to have a, a show you a little sample of what we've done in the tapings uh, from the Historical Society. You, can we roll that now? to Bowdoin Square, to Chelsea. We belong to one another. I always recall the expression my mother had when you got as far as Bowdoin Square. If you left there, you're out of town from that time on. Spring Street, that was the place. Did you describe Spring Street? It was lined with stores on both sides. The horses used to come down to the middle, and middle, so sometimes it didn't smell so good. <laughs> It was like, and you, you, you name it, you could get any kind of food you wanted, and there was a bakery there, so was bakery, mm -hmm. they still, still, still moved up. Mm -hmm. The best bake was, there used to be a lot of bake stores. There was a little store, I think it was on Leverett Street, they used to make homemade sausages in the base, and people used to come from all over. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of these little food stores that people would come from out of town just to shop. Mm -hmm. And you walk down Spring Street, you, you name it, there was a store that sold pickles, I remember. And he had a big pickle barrel outside. He'd stick his hand and pull out a pickle. Nobody cared about sanitary measures right. and throw it in the paper. Uh, Saturday was my big treat. My mother would take me by the hand while she went food shopping on Spring Street, which was the shopping place. She would drop me off at Barney Chef's Delicatessen, give me a big crumb beef sandwich and a chocolate soda, which to me was heaven, and pick me up on the way home after she had done her shopping. experience in that downtown was so close and what your neighbor. I mean, we play ball on a common just as much as we played anywhere else. You go ice skating at a public garden. You want to go to the movies, you went to the Scully or the Bowden Bowden or the Orphan and you walked there. Yeah. There was a guy who lived in our building who was a third assistant manager of the Scully and I used to go there on Drop Saturday up, yeah. mornings and stay there yeah. for about six hours, you know, because he'd get me in. You know, uh, and then in the summertime, the kids go where? Frog Pond. Where? Frog Pond in the yeah. common. It was a theater at North Station, and I think that theater now is a pussycat theater. It's a porno theater. <laughs> and uh, um, we probably didn't have any extra money, or if we did, probably my parents wanted to save it and not waste it on uh, um, theaters and so forth, not too many of them, because um, I thought, well, wouldn't it be wonderful if I could go to the theater every week, you know, and uh, find a way where I wouldn't have to pay. The kids at the street always had a lot of good information, and they told me that if you went there on a Saturday morning, they were always auditioning people to be in the Lancaster chorus. And if you were chosen that you could go, they would give you a pin, and you could go in there and see the free movies every week. 
I have never been able to keep a tune. I never had a good singing voice. One of the kids I played with had a magnificent voice, and she turned out to be a professional singer. Was However, her name? her name was Diane Sussman, and her father was an attorney, I remember. Anyway, um, she sang beautifully. Um, light, uh, light opera, I believe. Anyway, um, who cared? You know, we thought it would be a good shot to take, and maybe we could get in and see a movie and free. So we both went. The kids on the street told me that it doesn't matter how good your voice is. When they call you and they put you out of line and tell you to sing the scale up and down, sing as loud as you can. Shriek at the top of your voice, because that's the one who is selected. I did what they told me, and they said, okay, you're in. Diana Sussman, who had this beautiful, light voice, sang like a lighting gill, out, oh. too quiet. <laughs> so in between the uh, two pictures, the man would come out on the stage, the conductor, we would all stand up, and there was a bouncing ball on the screen, and we would sing. I just mouthed it, but I got to see a free movie. Okay. Mm -hmm. In the street, on the sidewalks, pencil up with chalk, right. play hopscotch. The play, there was always a ball game going between the Blackstone and the Welsh because it was, it was adjoining. Yeah, you yeah, probably right. remember. Right. And they used to play ball right. back and forth. Every Sunday there was a ball game going there. The people down around Child Street, they had the Child's Bank. And if we had to go, we, we had to walk, we had to walk there to do any, uh, playing football, okay. or we want to play baseball, we had to go to the commons. Okay. I can remember playing football. We used to fill up a bag full of newspaper, and we used to toss the bag back and forth. Okay, that's, that's good. Some of the other games you used to play with your kids? Well, we played, we, we played, um, we played relievo. Okay. But, but how many fingers up? Uh -huh. We played kick the can. That was a great game. We loved that. In other words, it was the kind of a neighborhood that I would want to grow up in if I had the good fortune to grow up in. Our next guest is Philip Bergen from the Bostonian Society, which is a very prominent old-time Boston Historical Society. Welcome, Phil. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Thank you. Philip, uh, can you tell us uh, the purpose of the Bostonian Society and its origin? Well, the Bostonian Society has been around since the early 1880s. It has been known as the city's historical society. There, there is no such animal right now as the Boston Historical Society, but it was originally founded for the purpose of saving the old state house, which in the early 1880s was threatened with being torn down and moved to Chicago, of all places. It, Sometimes it seems hard to believe that a building that you associate so much uh, with Boston as the old state house would have been in any danger of being torn down, but it was in the middle of State Street, a busy street. It was considered an eyesore at the time. It had not been renovated for quite some time. So a group of Bostonians got together for the express purpose of saving the building. And at the same time, not only did they save the building, but they also wanted to turn it into a museum of Boston history. They became known as the Bostonian Society, and ever since it has been dedicated to preserving and protecting different aspects of Boston's history. We have a library that collects books and photographs and maps and documents on the history of the city of Boston, and we also operate the old State House as a museum today. That's located right on the Freedom Trail? Okay. That's right. The l old State House is at the corner of State Street and Washington Street, the business district and the shopping district. And the library and the offices of the, old, of the Bostonian Society are right across the street at 15 State Street. Okay. We're in the same building that the National Park Service uses for a visitor center, but we're up on the third floor. And do you get many tourists to come in, or what is the mixture of tourists versus people from local people? We get a very good mixture of local people, people that have a particular interest in Boston. As far as the old State House goes, we get mostly people from outside of Boston. We really have a worldwide group of people that come to see the building. 
It is one of the sites on the Freedom Trail, and it is something that many people have either heard about or seen, and they want to come and visit it while they're in Boston. As far as the library goes, we get people from all over. I get uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 22 to 2,500 visitors a year. And that may be either visitors in person or in some cases by telephone or letter that are interested in finding out some aspect of Boston's history. Mm -hmm. And what observes what the, the history? How can the society help them? I think one of the things that people can do to preserve history is to realize that, in fact, everybody who is in, living in Boston matter is part of history. Almost everybody has a photo album. Almost everybody has memories of their past. In many cases, we have grandparents or people that have been around longer than we have. And what is happening here in the, at the West End is that people are being asked to videotape or orally tape what goes on and what their memories are of times gone by. I think that people tend to forget or think that they are not important, an individual person, that they are not part of history. And that's not the case. I firmly believe that history is made up of the stories of everybody, regardless of whether or not they're in government or they're businessmen or they're politicians or whatever they are. They are the bakers, the housewives, the school teachers, the blue collar workers that make up Boston, make up all of the different neighborhoods and make up the city itself as a complete entity. Mm -hmm. So that in Boston itself there are anywhere from 10 to a dozen different historical societies that represent various neighborhoods besides the West End. And people who are interested in Charlestown or Roxbury or Brighton or the Back Bay have groups of people right now that are working to keep the memories of these places alive, both through photographs, collecting newspapers, pamphlets, uh, books, in some cases oral histories and reminiscences, so that there is a group of people in the city who are working, for the most part, on their spare time. They do this as a labor of love, their interest evening or weekend to work on this. And I think that's great. I think that's one way that we're going to be able to pass down knowledge of what Boston is like in 1989 to Bostonians in the year 2089. Great. I noticed that uh, most of the historical societies today are made up of of people who are not, not, there's not too many younger people interested in it today. What can you say to us today to encourage our younger people to get involved in, in history and in preserving of it and making of it? I think to a large extent that comes from an interest that is developed either at home or in school. If you have a good school teacher that interests you in learning about your area, if you have parents or people that you are familiar with that can talk to you about the past. I know when I was growing up in Boston, I had grandparents and I had my parents to tell me what it was like, and in their case in the 19 teens, the 1920s. I think that whetted my interest, and I think that one thing that the local historical societies are starting to do now is to realize that there is, there are similar groups around the city that are doing the same thing. I think for too long, if you were in West Roxbury and involved with the West Roxbury Historical Society, let's say, you weren't necessarily aware that there was another group in Brighton or another group in South Boston that was doing the same sort of thing. So people felt that there was a little island to their community. And that's not really the case. In Boston, people have moved from neighborhood to neighborhood, and things have changed so much that there is a great deal to be discovered about the history of Boston from learning about its past. Mm -hmm. that's, 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 that's fine. How many people are in your group today? Well, the Bostonian Society is a membership group, and it is open to anybody who's interested in the history. We have right now about 1,100 to 1,200 uh, different people that belong. We also have corporate memberships for companies in Boston, but the library itself is open to anyone who wants to use it. You don't have to be a member. You don't have to pay anything to come in and use our facilities, and we're always glad to have people come in. Do you have a telephone number you could give us? Or? Yes, the library itself is phone number is 720-3285, and we're open weekdays from 9.30 to 4.30 at 15 State Street. Great. Well, I'd like to thank our guest today. You've brought back a bit of Boston history and nostalgia, and I, you've done a great, great job, and I'm, this has been a real interesting show. Uh, I, I was real pleased with the outcome. Thank you for being here today, and see you at the next West End Video Newsletter.